A husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 127, To Boldly Go. I am your host, Joseph Whalen, and my creative and colorful co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? I'm good. How are you? I am doing well. So we skipped a week last week. Mm -hmm. We had a very busy schedule. Uh, we had a lot of marching band stuff happening last week. More of it to come. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we had a lot of very fatigued people around the house thanks to marching band. Yep. <laughs> and uh, we just didn't have the energy to do the podcast last week. Yeah. But in the meantime, we did get a new camera. So Yay. <laughs> we're, we're running with a new wide shot here on our camera three. So it's for you uh, viewing audience out there. There you go. So this weekend we do have a busy, busy weekend ahead of us as well. So hopefully we'll have the energy to throw a podcast together next week. We shall see. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're coming up on the, uh, the apex, I guess, of marching band. Yeah, this is probably the busiest uh, yeah, so. week coming up, weekend coming up. So we may be everything. going to an every other week arrangement, probably until November when marching band events are over. Yeah. And then we can pick things back up. But we'll see. We're, we're trying to get them out there, but it's it's a rough schedule. Right. We, you know, we need downtime, you know, as well. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Well, plus, we're, I'm, you know, we're producing True. for band now as well. I've right. been roped into. Um, You've been voluntold. I've been voluntold. <laughs> To use my video resources to now to help out record and, yeah. video and audio for the band, and we're putting director's cuts videos together and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So that's even more time consuming for me at this point. But anyway, moving right along, we are talking entertainment today. So today in our Disney Detective, how a villain avoids breaking character plus fifty years after opening, and these workers never left. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, the Galactic Star Cruiser is getting its own comics, and just how dangerous would a dark side Luke actually be? And in our entertainment news, William Shatner is finally reaching for the final frontier, then a touching moment between Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga during his final performance. And as always, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and a few remaining afterthoughts. They're dropping off rapidly as we wane on through the year, mm -hmm. uh, but there are a few left to still talk about. But before we do that, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you can find the audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. Video versions of all of our podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. And we can be found on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty much any place you can get a podcast. I would also invite folks to write in, give us your feedback, give us your shows that we can talk about. If there's other uh, comic book shows, toy shows, pop culture shows we can plug for you, you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com or hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast and Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. Or you can get links to all that on our official website at insights into things.com. Are we ready? Let's do it. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So, as many people know, Disney refers to their employees as cast members, even if you aren't playing a popular known character. But for those who do face characters, there are significant challenges to the role that other than just learning the lines. So for one dedicated Disney cast member, possibly the biggest challenge of their acting career may have been when they were facing off against a pint-sized version of themselves. <laughs> Posted by TikTok account Bad Parenting Moments, Maleficent's hilarious exchange with her tiny doppelganger garnered over 20 million views and nearly 10,000 comments. 
So in the video, a very in-character Maleficent is put to the test when a villainous toddler approaches her. It's awfully small, the evil queen sneers at the tiny tot, who then promptly blows her a sweet kiss. Maleficent asks the toddler's mom, Is it blowing me a kiss? Who smiles, standing uh, while watching close by. And the true test of Maleficent's acting skills comes when the toddler touches the villainess's gloved hand, forcing the queen to turn a stony face and then look off into the crowd. So while the evil evildoer never officially broke character, many TikTokers feel that the actress's face betrays just how desperately she just wanted to hug the toddler. Thousands of TikToks, uh, TikTokers shared their reaction to the sweet moment in the comments. One said, I love how they just don't break character. I would have totally broken character. She was just way too cute. Another one had said, oh my God, her face, it's so precious. Another person had said, you can just see how tr hard it is that she's not breaking character because she's just so cute. And then, of course, at the end, she's trying so hard not to smile and just hug her. And another person said, I would have melted like ice on a summer day. So thanks to dedicated performers like this talented Maleficent, Disney World continues to be a place of magic and joy for kids everywhere, and obviously the kids at heart, too. So let me guess. This is your attempt to fight my bashing of Disney to find every cute little kid story at Disney to put out there now. Yeah. Nice. That's it. This was cute. Unfortunately, when I pulled up the article, uh, the the link wasn't in there. Right, right. Um, to uh, to view it because it is a really uh, cute video to actually yeah, and watch. it's really it's really short. It's not very long, but you can tell you know at one point Maleficent kind of turns her head right, because if she right. had any more interaction with the toddler, she would have completely lost it and and wanted to to just love on her. And that's what I think is so great about the Disney characters, especially the villains how they work almost extra hard yeah. to yeah. be bad, to be mean, you know? So from the evil stepsisters to even Gaston, there there was an article, uh, you know, from a couple of months ago where this, you know, 20-year-old right, woman was, yeah. like, flirting with him, and he was just kind of like, Well, I whatever. remember we did the one character uh, meal. Um, where was it? Did the one character meal and, and we it was the, the Grand Floridian that well yeah that so was it was the one. stepsisters yeah the evil, Cinderella's and, uh, stepsisters and the one stepsister came around and she was hilarious mm -hmm. but she was hilarious in character right and she did it in such a way as to be entertaining for the adults mm -hmm. but also entertaining for the kids at the yeah. same time so yeah. it wasn't like adult humor but it was. The sarcasm. It was the 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 dark humor type right, stuff, right? Where kids probably wouldn't have understood exactly. what she was exactly. insinuating, but the parents did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they do they do do a fantastic mm -hmm. job with it. Yeah. And then of course we always have the one famous incident where we had the camera break on us, right? And the char they weren't face characters; they no. were they were costume characters. Mm -hmm. And they were running around like crazy playing hide and seek and, and duck, 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 goose, goose. <laughs> and everything else just to keep one little girl occupied. Yep. When they could have very easily walked us outside and put us back in the line and told us to wait till they got a new camera. Right. So kudos to them for that. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing it there for 50 years. 50 now. years. 50 years. And some people have never even left. So they've been trapped there for 50 years, right? They, they, get, they get put in Tupperware at the end of the night and they, they don't get let out. Tell us about the veterans that have been there for that long. So applying to be one of the first workers at Walt Disney World, high school graduate George uh, Caligridis made a split-second decision that set the course of his life. He picked a room where prospective hotel workers were being hired. Chuck Milan got a tip about a job opening from a transplanted Disney executive whose new house he was landscaping. Erlene Anderson jumped at the chance to take a job at the new Disney-themed park in Florida, having fallen in love with the beauty of Disneyland in California during a trip she had taken two years earlier. 
At the time, the three were among the first 6,000 employees who opened the Magic Kingdom at Disney World to the public for the first time on October 1st, 1971. Now, they are among about two dozen from that first day who are still employed at the theme park resort as it celebrated its 50th anniversary the beginning of this month. Over those decades, Disney added three more theme parks, two dozen additional hotels, and grew to have a workforce of 77,000 employees as it helped Orlando become the most visited place in the U.S. before the pandemic. What never changed was the original employees' devotion to the pixie dust, the dream machine created by Walt Disney and his Imagineers. Disney has been my love, and it still is, Erlene had said recently before starting her shift in merchandising at the Magic King at a Magic Kingdom hotel. She said, I love Disney. The employees who make up the 50-year club say the theme park resort has allowed them to grow their careers and try on new hats. George worked his way up to become the president of Walt Disney World and Disneyland in California. Chuck went from a warehouse worker to a buyer of spare parts for rides and shows. Forrest um, Baruth joined the workforce at Walt Disney World in January of 1971 as a show director responsible for staging and choreographing parades and shows. He was given the opportunity to help open other Disney theme parks around the world over the past five decades. He said, there are people all over the world who get to go to work, they're unhappy about it, and they don't really like their jobs. But as you can tell from us, there's an enthusiasm. We are privileged to be at a place where we love what we do. Uh, There were no guarantees that Disney World was going to be a success 50 years ago. Walt Disney, the pioneering animator and entrepreneur whose name graces the Florida resort, had actually died in 1966, just a year after announcing plans for the East Coast Disneyland. The company had quietly um, acquired 27,000 acres of scrub land outside of Orlando for about $5 million via secret land purchases using fake names and shell companies. The job of shepherding the project to opening day fell on his brother, Roy Disney, who, with other company officials, convinced the Florida legislature to create a quasi-governmental agency that would allow Disney to self-govern when it came to masters, uh, sorry, matters of infrastructure and planning. Roy uh, died almost three months after Disney World opened. Just weeks before opening, construction on the Magic Kingdom was controlled chaos, and it seemed impossible that it would all come together in time. It was like an army of ants. Everything was under construction, interiors were still being put up, roofing was still getting put on top, Forrest had said. Things were, uh, there was painting and landscaping, things were arriving by the moment, it was like trucks going everywhere. Forrest had re- uh, rehearsed performers throughout the parade choreography down Main Street, which cuts through the center of the Magic Kingdom and resembles the turn-of-the-century small town from Walt Disney's childhood. Even though he was a busser, George was drafted to lay down sod outside the hotel that he was working in hours before Disney World's grand opening. Two things have stuck in the memories of the longtime employees from that opening day. The first was the photo. It was an image of thousands of Disney World cast members standing in front of the iconic Cinderella Castle with uh, Mickey Mouse and other costumed characters holding hands in front. Two weeks later, it was featured on the cover of Life magazine. They brought all the characters up, staged them first, and then they tried to keep all of the different workers together based on the color of their costumes, Chuck had said. The second was the parade. It featured a 1,076 member marching band conducted by Meredith Wilson, who was the composer of the Broadway show The Music Man. There were 4,000 Disney entertainers marching through the theme park, a mass choir, and trumpeters from the United States Army Band. 
Hundreds of white doves were released in the air, and less environmentally friendly uh, were thousands of multicolored balloons. It was the biggest thing I had ever seen, Forrest had said. Um, but only around 10,000 visitors actually showed up that day, which at today's much larger Walt Disney World would represent about 90 minutes worth of visitors entering. Um, they had said it wouldn't be until Thanksgiving of 1971, almost three months later, when Disney executives had an answer about whether their new resort would be a, a success. That's when cars trying to get to the Magic Kingdom stretched for miles down the interstate. It was very clear after that first Thanksgiving that the public definitely liked where they were going. That first Thanksgiving, that was the moment. That's pretty impressive. I mean, just to think of being anywhere for that long is astonishing. To oh, me. absolutely. Um, I can't picture myself being at any company for 50 years. Uh, you know, I'm at 22. <laughs> you're, you're getting there. I usually, I get to around, uh, what do I get to? Seven, Seven or years, eight, eight yeah. years, something like that. Right. And then I'm kind of lost at that point. In time. Yeah. And speaking of the life magazine, one of my Disney possessions happens to be, it's not a, a very good copy. There's some tears and stains on it, but this is the, the photo that they, they talk about that they took on opening day and right. ended up getting published. That's so, cool. yeah, very cool when you, you know, all right, let's take a picture. <laughs> Yeah. Everybody get together. Hurry up. Get together for a picture. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Everybody color code. What what costume are you wearing? Okay. You go over here. You go over here. Yeah. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. So anyway, 50 years. Do they get to retire at some point in time? <laughs> I don't know. Some of them might want to. <laughs> some of them, you know. They're still pretty young looking for, you know. The, yeah. Well, you, you figure, know. you know, if you were in high school, you know, you were not even 20. Yeah. You know, yeah. so maybe it's one it's, of those, uh, or you know, you just kind of work part time, or yeah, a, I don't not know. Not a bad job if you can get it. No, right? not at all. So that was it for our uh, Disney detective. We'll be back in a minute after our quick break with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. For over seven years. The Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So this week in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, uh, Disney's Galactic Star, Tru Star Cruiser gets the Marvel treatment. StarWars.com writes that the voyages are the greatest of all Star Cruisers as the legendary Halcyon embarks on a momentous cruise, the ship heads towards a confrontation with the First Order. But with... Uh, but what secret from the High Republic era can help the passengers and crew all these years later? And how did Jedi Nibs and Burry fend off a heel attack on one of the ship's first ever voyages? Well, the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser Halcyon is ready to launch, and you're invited along for the ride. Star Wars Halcyon Legacy is a new five-issue comic book miniseries from Marvel debuting later this year. Later, debuting next year, sorry. I should just read it the way it's written, right? Yeah. Written by Ethan Sachs, who penned the recent Star Wars Bounty Hunters run with art by Will Slinney, 
whose work includes Star Wars, The Rise of Kylo Ren, and others, the series reunites the creative team behind the Star Wars Galaxy's Edge comic series for a new adventure that ties into the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser experience opening at Walt Disney World Resort in March 2022. In a recent interview with StarWars.com, Sachs recounts, In the summer of 1977, my life was forever changed as a four-year-old boy by two experiences that have seared themselves into my brain for all these years. Seeing Star Wars in the movie theater and visiting Disney World for the first time. The chance to contribute to the lure of both with Halcyon Legacy the tale of the ship that will be an integral memory for so many fellow fans is an incredible honor. <clears throat> and to reteam with my Galaxy's Edge co-pilot, artist extraordinaire, extraordinaire Will Slinney makes it extra special. I promise we'll bake that joy into every page of every issue as we take you on a journey across 275 years of epic adventures from the High Republic the time of the First Order, you're going to enjoy this ride. With a story that spans centuries, readers can revisit the iconic ship at different points in the Star Wars timeline, reunite with familiar faces like the ultimate scoundrel pairing of Lando and Hondo teaming up for the first time, travel the stars with a featured tale that leads into the events of the Walt Disney World experience taking place between Star Wars The Last Jedi and Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Marvel Comics Editor-in-Chief C.B. Sobolski adds, As a lifelong Star Wars fan, I'm thrilled to be a part of the team helping to bring Halcyon Legacy to life. We've all been able to experience Star Wars in so many ways over the years, from watching the films to playing with the toys to reading the comics to even visiting Batu and drinking in the cantina. But now Walt Disney World is taking things to the next level with this immersive, interactive experience. Our series will get you up to speed on this important part of the galaxy far, far away as you prepare to put on your cloak, pick up your lightsaber, and blast off in Orlando. And spend $5,000 for two nights. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Since this uh, article came out, we also got the pre-order uh, available for DVC members. Which, in less than a day and a half, had sold out. Which is <laughs> painfully encouraging for Disney. Mm. Because it tells Disney that no matter what they charge, people are going to pay the rates. Right. Now, this preview, it wasn't just for DVC. It was also... Uh, annual, annual pass holders right. as well were were part of right. that as well. So yes. So how many points was it for the two night stay? Uh, I think it was going to be around six hundred or so per person. That's reasonable, right? How much is a cruise? Uh, less than six hundred yeah. person. <laughs> yeah, a five night <laughs> cruise. Five night cruise, maybe it's about four or five, maybe yeah. six, depending on the the state room you have. Yeah, right. yeah maybe I don't right. know. We've never actually priced out a cruise. And so. this this is bottom line prices. Right. This was like the cheap room yeah. <laughs> that fit, sleeps uh, five. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. still still very disappointed at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you, you left me feeling too good with our. Or, so you had to put a dig. Yeah, I had to so, put something in there. So, hey, read all this story and get really hyped up about a real ship that you can go on that you're never going to have enough money to, to go sure and do. But make sure you get a deal in the comic so you can save your money for the actual <laughs> trip. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> anyway. Oh, Disney. <laughs> anyway, moving right along. So what other happy Star Wars news do you have? So we also are talking about uh, how dangerous a dark side Luke would be. This one comes from our friends at Screen Rant. Finally, Star Wars has revealed just how dangerous a dark side Luke Skywalker would be. The Tatooine farm boy with a thirst for adventure who learned he was the son of a Jedi Knight, Luke would prove that one man can change the history of an entire galaxy when he shot down the Death Star and again 
when he successfully redeemed Darth Vader, leading the Sith apprentice to turn on his master. Luke is a legendary figure, renowned for his strength in the Force and his unshakable belief in the possibility of redemption. Naturally, Star Wars fans have always wondered just what would happen if Luke Skywalker ever turned to the dark side. The old Expanded Universe toyed with that idea in the Dark Empire comics, in which Luke bent knee before a resurrected Emperor, but even then it didn't last long, with Luke himself redeemed by the love of his friends and family. That story isn't even canon anymore, with Disney declaring the Expanded Universe, quote, legends, when they acquired Lucasfilm in 2012. The question still feels relatively unresolved, though. Amusingly, the Star Wars special Lego Star Wars Terrifying Tales actually provides an answer, albeit a non-canon one. It features an account of the Death Star's destruction by Darth Vader's twisted servant, Vinay, who turns the original Star Wars story on its head by telling a tale in which Star, uh, Star, yeah, Star Lord, right, in which Luke Skywalker joined the Empire instead of the Rebellion. Power hungry and eager for fame and celebrity, this version of Luke proved himself a skilled pilot and even earned the attention of Darth Vader himself. He became Darth Vader's apprentice, training in the ways of the Force, and it was clear he had even more power than the man he did not know was his father. Ironically, Luke's story ended in the same way when he fired a stray shot during the battle over the Death Star and accidentally obliterated it. No doubt in Vinay's version, Luke joined the Rebellion in order to claim he'd intended to fire that shot all along. Of course, this is just a tall tale told in a Halloween special. But the really striking thing about the account of Darth Vader's servant Vinay is how easily it could have happened. Viewers tend to forget that Luke Skywalker's dreams of seeing the galaxy were originally leading him to join the Empire. And in fact, in the first film, he fought with his uncle over whether it was time for him to enlist. Luke's heroic journey really began when Imperial stormtroopers gunned down his aunt and uncle, giving him a personal reason to oppose, oppose the Empire. Things could have easily turned out differently. Lucasfilm is increasingly diving into non-canon Star Wars stories, most notably with the Star Wars Visions animated series, and it's possible these can give viewers a better glimpse of a dark side Luke Skywalker. For now, though, Lego Star Wars terrifying tales suggest he would be a force to reckon with. And and we haven't, you know, full disclosure, we haven't seen it yet. Right. We were going to watch it this weekend, but we just never we, got our We had so it. much other stuff to watch <laughs> in our sloth-like states this weekend. Yeah, yeah. So. so much so we even missed one of the toy shows we wanted to go to. Yeah, exactly. Not that we weren't talking about it for, like... Two months. <laughs> I know. We, we plugged it all this time and it never even, they were never like, even went. They were like, oh, crud, we missed that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember reading the uh, Dark Empire comics and they were really good. In fact, they have put out a limited edition series of figures, which I have all the figures from it mm -hmm. as well. Um, and the artwork is gorgeous in it. So if you get a chance, go back and read it. Even if you, even if you get the digital versions of it, um, it made for a very... Um, interesting take on what an alternate version of Darth Vader's story could have been too, mm, which was really okay. good. And it also lends a little bit of credence to the rise of Skywalker and the resurrection of the emperor. And you can kind of see where elements of that storyline for the movie came from the expanded universe. Okay. Um, it was executed in probably the worst possible way imaginable. <laughs> Had they just stuck with the story from the comics, it would have been awesome. <clears throat> uh, but they didn't. So anyway, Dark Side Luke Skywalker. Okay. And that's it for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We'll be back in a minute with our entertainment news. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. 
talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So William Shatner can now say that he's gone boldly where no man his age has gone before. He's certainly not the first person to visit space, but as of today, Wednesday, the Star Trek veteran is now the oldest. At 90, the actor joined Blue Origin, founded by Amazon founder Jeff Bezos in 2000, for its second human space flight. Shatner and three others were launched in a new Shepard rocket from the aerospace company's West Texas launch site just before 11 a.m. today. The crew safely landed back on Earth several minutes later when Shatner could be heard saying that the experience was unlike anything they had described. All four passengers on board gave a thumbs up to the recovery crew upon landing to indicate that they were okay. Bezos greeted the passengers with a double thumbs up outside the landing capsule, following, followed by the passengers family and family and friends who cheered and applauded. Shatner told Bezos, in a way, it's indescribable. Not only is it different than what you thought, it happened so quickly. The impression I had that I never expected to have is the shooting up and there's the blue sky. And then Bezos sprayed him with a bottle of champagne. <laughs> uh, everybody in the world needs to do this. Everybody in the world needs to see it, Shatner continued. It was unbelievable. The little things, the weightlessness, but the just to see the blue color of the sky whip up you know, whip you up and now you're, you're staring into blackness and then it's gone. It was also moving. This experience did something unbelievable. Bezos, uh, he had told, also said to Bezos, what you had given me is the most profound experience I can imagine. I hope I never recover from this. Shatner is obviously best known as playing Captain James T. Kirk in the Star Trek fr franchise. And he had said in a press release on October 4th, they had heard about space, you know, for a long time now. And he was taking the opportunity to see it for himself. But Shatner also admitted to being very nervous to go up into space. He said, I'm terrified during New York's Comic Con last Thursday, according to Space.com. He said, I know, I'm Captain Bloody Kirk and I'm terrified. The launch had actually been scheduled for Tuesday, but forecasting high winds prompted a delay to the following day. Blue Origin announced prior to the launch that it, that it would only last just about 10 minutes, with the fully automated capsule reaching a maximum altitude of about 66 miles before parachuting back into the desert. Along with Shatner, the space flight passengers in Blue Origin's second human space flight included Blue Origin's Vice President of Mission and Flight Operations, Audrey Powers, a former NASA engineer and tech entrepreneur, Chris Bowizen, and the founder of a clinical trier so software company, Glenn DeVries. The latter two passengers paid for tickets on the flight. Blue Origin has not publicly disclosed the price of the tickets, though Bezos has previously said the total of tickets sold were nearing $100 million. So it, this is cool, okay? I, I'm not going to take anything away right. from Shatner for this. I mean, the man's 90 years old. And he just sh got shot in the space on a rocket. Yeah. Now, it's important to point out this wasn't an orbital shot. Mm -mm. This was a ballistic trajectory up and down. Right. Which in and of itself is 
impressive that we can do this with mm -hmm. common regularity now when right. you think at the beginning of the space race, we couldn't even manage something to like this. To get anything up, right? Ne let alone come back down. Right. You know? And it's funny you use that terminology given what the rocket looks like. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm sure everybody that's listening knows what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, we didn't show a picture. We didn't need anyway. to show pictures. Um, but this is a gimmick. This is doing absolutely. absolutely nothing for space tourism. It's doing nothing for space exploration or technology advancements. Nothing. We've been able to do this for quite some time mm -hmm. now. And these little jaunts up and down are, 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 uh, they're attention grabbers. Mm -hmm. That's it. Oh, absolutely. What was impressive was when SpaceX put its first tourists up into space in the orbit at an orbit higher than the International Space Station for three days. Yeah. It was the furthest humans had been away from Earth since we went to the moon. Right. That is significant. Absolutely. This was this was kind of just the we you know, this was like the Disneyland ver you know version of Mission to Mars. Like, right. oh, I can. F I've been on a centrifuge now, so I can go into right. space. So in this, you know. because they don't have to achieve orbital velocity, which mm -hmm. is 16, 14,500 miles an hour, I think it is, the acceleration is much more tame. You hit maybe 2G, 2.5G right. going up, which is roughly what you get on an amusement ride. Mm -hmm. Right. So the rigors on the body are not nearly as as right the fact that significant. you don't have a specialized suit you don't right. have to wear any sort of helmet you're basically just you know the whole thing literally took 10 minutes from the closest thing start i can equate finish. this to is you have the plane the vomit comet yes where the plane itself flies ballistic arcs up and down mm -hmm. and during the down arc you are weightless Mm -hmm. That is essentially the same thing as what they did. They just mm -hmm. didn't accelerate to the top of the arc as fast. Mm -hmm. And they didn't go as high. They don't go as high in the plane. Right. Um, so, yes, this is cool. Captain Kirk finally made it to space. Right. Um, I really wish we would stop giving so much attention to this stuff, though, and at least force Bezos and Virgin Galactic to do something more with mm -hmm. this. Right. You know, to do something more creative, something that betters humanity. This is essentially a balloon ride. Right. And it's doing absolutely nothing. It's $100 million in tickets for what? To shoot a bunch of rockets up? Right. Now, I will say it was very cool to see it go up because basically, you know, they they didn't have much training because there's nothing for them right, to do it's because automated. it's all, you know, automated. Right. But that's what's part of – I think that's what was fascinating more to me, the fact that it it went up and then when the capsule split, the main body came back down. It, it – okay, I'm done with what I had to do. I'm going to come to – and like had this perfect landing. Right. That to me was like, wow, yeah, that's that is pretty impressive. freaking cool. That's where – I would love to see them advance it more. Yes. Like, okay, now that you can get people up and this part can come back, now you need to do other stuff out in space. Yes. Like, go beyond the whole, okay, cool, you've been in space now. And, I'm totally with you there. You know, yeah, great. This is something everybody should see. Okay, when it's not... <laughs> <laughs> millions of dollars right, right? and people I don't think I would ever want to do it because I'm not a fan of flying in general. right no I'm with you so, so so like part of me is going okay well it's only 10 minutes you know you figure when you take off in a plane it takes about you know three or four minutes to to get to the altitude you know and then by the time you're you're coming back down I don't know that landing was kind of whoo yeah. that was a little jarring too yeah so, no, I'm totally with you on that. Yeah, one. yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it was cool, mm -hmm. and uh, I I'd, I'd like to see more of it, but I like to see it be a little bit more advanced. Mm -hmm. So, moving on with our geriatric uh, portion <laughs> of the show here. 
So Lady Gaga was thrilled that Tony Bennett had recognized her during the pair's final performance together at Radio City Music Hall in August, according to a 60 Minutes interview on CBS. The 95-year-old singer has been battling Alzheimer's disease since 2016. Both Bennett's family and Lady Gaga had shared details of his battle with the debilitating the debilitating disease during a CBS special which aired the other week on 60 uh, on 60 minutes the special included a one-on-one interviews and clips from Bennett's final performance Lady Gaga revealed that during the first few weeks the two had spent time together since COVID-19 pandemic had begun Bennett referred to her as sweetheart and she was unsure if he actually knew who she was. But then she walked out on stage during their final show together, and it was heartwarming to see that he recognized the singer. When Gaga walked on stage, she greeted him with, Hey, Tony, as the crowd cheered, and Bennett exclaimed, Whoa, Lady Gaga! She appeared incredibly delighted by his response, bent over in laughter before twirling around on stage in a golden dress, after which he added, I'd like that, I'd like that, do it again. So Lady Gaga continued to twirl before approaching Bennett for their duet. She said, that was the first time that Tony had said my name in a long time. Unfortunately, memory loss is a key aspect of dementia and Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia and affects an estimated 60 to 80% of all people with dementia. Despite his diagnosis, Bennett continued to perform and sing and remembered Gaga for his final show. I had to keep it together because we had a sold out show and I have a job to do. But I'll tell you, when I walked out on stage and he said, it's Lady Gaga, my friend saw me and it was very special to me, she had said. Bennett doesn't let his disease get in the way of performing and making music that everybody loves. When that music comes on, something happens to him. He knows exactly what he's doing and what's important for me, actually, is just to make sure that I don't get in the way of that, Lady Gaga had told CBS. The two have a strong uh, relationship and first collaborated on Bennett's album, Duets 2, when... Uh, and then on their uh, co-album in 2014, Cheek to Cheek. They recently joined forces on what will be Bennett's last album, uh, Love for Sale, according to People. Bennett's wife, Susan, also opened up about her husband's Alzheimer's battle during the special. She says, he recognizes me, thank goodness, his children, you know, and uh, we're blessed in a lot of ways. He's very sweet. He doesn't know what he has. Backstage during the show, uh, Susan was seen watching Lady Gaga set with Bennett and reminded uh, that he was going out to perform that evening as well. But as soon as the curtain rose to reveal Bennett on stage, he seemed like his old self again. Once he saw the audience and, you know, and he raises his hands, we knew everything was going to be okay because he became himself and it just turned on like a light switch to close out the night. Lady Gaga asked Bennett if she could have the honor of escorting him off the stage. Just simply being the woman that got to walk him off stage was enough for me. Viewers then watched as Lady Gaga was fighting through tears, told Bennett that she, uh, that he was so amazing and spectacular during the final performance. And it's, it is amazing that, that given the condition that he has, that he can continue to perform the way yeah, he does. Yeah, and, and when the original airing of the show of the 60 Minutes piece aired, I actually had missed it. I, I knew it was coming up and I ended up missing it. So I found it online. And when I saw the, the article talking about it, I wanted to watch it. And it was just, it, it was so sad in a way because you saw him just sitting there like kind of in a trance because he didn't know what was going on. And then in the next room, his his musical arranger is sitting there playing at the piano and he just like, it's like a light switch literally yeah. came on and he just walked in and didn't have anything in front of him, didn't have any music in front of him. And he starts playing and they played for an hour and a half straight of all these different songs. And he didn't like every now and then might might have missed a beat or something. But for the most part, you would have not yeah. known that and he was as sick as he was 
and like a lot of that. people might look at that and say, my God, why are you making this man continue to perform until you realize that it's that performing that brings the man back out? That's, that's exactly what they were saying is that, you know, at the time – when they had talked about do and I guess the um, they were sub, they were doing two nights for this concert and they're actually uh, they had taped it so the concert is actually going to be played uh, I think later this year on CBS as as a special um, and when they had booked it they had actually booked it before the pandemic and he you know wasn't as sick and of course as time went on. It was like, well, do we cancel it? Do we not? What What do we do? You know, but they kept rehearsing with him and he seemed to be OK. And, and that's when Lady Gaga was talking about how they got together and he would call her sweetheart. He never called her right, by right. name where he always knew her name beforehand. And, you know, they kept rehearsing. They finally got the dates. They were very, very nervous. Hi, Kitty. Uh, <laughs> they were very nervous about it. And as you know, and his wife, you know, was talking about she's walking him on stage, you know where you're going, right? And and he he didn't really know. But as soon as the music came up and the curtains open again, it was that that light switch yeah. came on where like his brain was just so hardwired over so many years of performing. Right. That that's the pattern that he falls into when the music starts. Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 you almost hate to see that taken away from him by not performing anymore. And that's what you kind of see with with some Alzheimer's patients or patients with dementia. There's that thing that like there's a, almost like there's a groove in the brain that you fall right. back into. You know, you you find music happens to be a big trigger yeah. for for some of them where, you know, a favorite song or something or if they were an artist, you know, you give them a paintbrush and they kind of, you know, that part of their brain still function. It's just that everything else is just so clouded, you know, uh, around it, you know, yeah. the disease. And I saw the clip where, you know, Tony says, there's my friend Lady Gaga. And she, you can tell she was ready to just burst into tears because yeah. it was like, oh, my God, he actually knows, you know, who I yeah. am. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, to, to seeing the special. Yeah. So. Good story. That's it for our entertainment news this week, which is good because it got a little too emotional there. <laughs> Let's move right along. Uh, we still have a show to finish up here ourselves. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick happens to be the new Muppets Haunted Mansion special that is on Disney+. Plus. So the great Gonzo, world-famous daredevil artist, has done it all, seen it all, survived it all. But on Halloween night, the fearless Gonzo takes on the greatest challenge of his life by spending one very daring night in the most grim, grinning place on Earth. The Haunted Mansion. I can't do it as well as you. Uh, inspired by all four of the iconic Disney Haunted Mansion attractions located across the go globe at various Disney parks, the Muppets Haunted Mansion includes many hidden Easter eggs for Disney fans and Muppet-sized sets and props that help immerse viewers in the storytelling experience. This marks the Muppets' first ever Halloween special and features three original songs, Rest in Peace, Life Hereafter, and Tie the Knot Tango. A star-studded Muppet cast, celebrity cameos, and spooky fun for families to enjoy together. Now, this was something I was looking forward to for months when they had announced it. You were kind of like, eh, all right, we'll watch it. So this was definitely on our watch list because it dropped on Friday. I was like, we are watching this on Saturday. Come on, let's all be happy. And we all enjoyed it. Um, you not being really a Muppet fan were very entertained by it. 
I was a Muppet fan as a kid, so I grew up with it. Um, and obviously, being a Haunted Mansion fan on top of it, this was like my two worlds, my my childhood kind of coming coming together. So it had a lot of very classic Muppet Show tributes, as well as a lot of Haunted Mansion tributes as well. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Getting all choked up. Um just a lot of inside jokes. Um, you know, if you're a, a fan of the Haunted Mansion, you you probably got all of them the first time around. And who doesn't love a, a screaming goat? So yeah. you didn't bring it up. No, I didn't. I should have. <laughs> anyway, good pick. <coughs> I did like it. It was very good. Thank you. We'll be right back. So my pick this week is an interesting documentary, How to Become a Tyrant on Netflix. I was inspired by recent political things. Ruling with an iron fist requires an aspiring dictator to know the playbook for absolute power as history's despots prove in this sardonic docuseries. A six-episode political documentary series narrated and produced by award-winning actor Peter Drink Dinklage explores what's needed to be a tyrannical leader based on history's best examples of tyrants. Each episode explores a specific aspect associated with successful dictators and cites specific examples from Hitler to Stalin. Interested in becoming a tyrant? There are rules, and the playbook for uh, a rise to dictatorship starts with one of history's most brutal, with Adolf Hitler. Once you've secured your place at the top, now the challenge is maintaining power, which means watching your back. Nobody did that better or more ruthlessly than Saddam Hussein. But dictatorships are about controlling the population. When keeping your population under control, it's bet is it better to be loved or feared? Idi Amin certainly thought he knew the right answer to that question. <coughs> the truth can often get in the way of a tyrant, which we learned under our previous administration, which is why controlling the truth and any information supporting that truth is key. The series explores that aspect of tyrants as well. Through public relations spin, revisionist history, and censorship, Soviet autocrat Joseph Stalin found a certain flexibility with the truth useful. Civil liberties are another impediment to dictators, something else we saw in the last four years. Free speech, right to assembly, rebel-turned-dictator Muammar Gaddafi realized that civil liberties had to go when reshaping society, but he got soft. The ultimate goal, though, is to rule forever, or at least to have your dynasty rule forever, which we saw in the last administration, too. <laughs> Seizing power is hard, but keeping it is harder. In North Korea, the Kim dynasty unlocked the secret to ruling forever. They just declare themselves gods, which we almost saw in the last administration. <laughs> So the show is really the ultimate in dark humor applied to politics. Much of the lessons are tongue-in-cheek looks at history's worst leaders and how they were able to muster and maintain control of their countries. The most disturbing thing of the document document the most disturbing thing of the documentary was the similarity in tactics exposed by so many other monsters in history and what we saw in our own country with the political rise of Donald Trump. By the end of the first episode, it's clear that this series is a cautionary tale of modern times and today's questionable political leadership told through the eyes of a historical retrospective. It doesn't take a university professor to see the point the show is driving home, that the United States lived through our own brush with a tyrant who exhibited most, if not all, of the traits associated with history's worst tyrants. It's an entertaining and educational look at all the warning signs to avoid another Trump presidency and should be shown to every classroom in the country. The sad thing is, as dramatic and realistic a call for help that it is, there's still a segment of the population that will still blindly fall in line behind the next wannabe tyrant 
just like so many other countries did with the subjects of this documentary series. I didn't get too political there, did I? No, no, no I not so. at all. I, I, I didn't I think I was, at all. I thought I was pretty neutral there. No, I think you were, totally. So that is my pick for this week, How to Become a Tyrant on Netflix. And we'll be right back. Oh, you're going to have to explain that because it sounds like I'm torturing <laughs> someone. So what is that? So this is our, our screaming goat. <laughs> okay, so why is the screaming goat so significant? Give well, us a walkthrough. you're going to have to watch the Haunted Mansion, Muppets Haunted Mansion okay, to know. No spoilers. That's no, no spoilers. spoilers. So once you, you know. Hold up for the mic. So obviously this isn't the goat from right. it. It just happens to be something that we picked up at Dave and & Buster's and we had a good laugh with it because we knew, you know, the significance so of it. maybe next week we'll come back and we can explain the joke. Maybe. We'll see. Maybe. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Anyway, so uh, what do we got now? We got uh, closing thoughts because we're done learning how to be a dictator, right? <laughs> right. We can move right So uh, October 22nd through the 24th in Oaks, Pennsylvania will be, I guess, the last Monster Mania for the year. Um, well, the year's th almost over, so it's true. okay. True. Yeah, so it's okay. Um, this is the first time they've ever been to this location. Unfortunately, we won't be able to, to go that weekend. So if anybody that's listening uh, does go, you know, drop us in. You know, marching band thing's really <laughs> starting to cramp our style when it comes to conventions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so let us know uh, how it is, uh, you know, what, it, what it's like. Because obviously we've been to numerous things at... Uh, that location, but never Monster Mania. Um, also that weekend, if you are in the Baltimore area, Baltimore Comic Con is back and it is October 22nd through the 24th as well, located, excuse me, not too far from the Inner Harbor area. Beautiful um, area there, by Yeah, the way. beautiful area. Definitely a much more comic centric right um whereas like monster mania there's monster stuff but there's lots of vendors and things like this with baltimore when we went of course it's been many it's years been a long time it was definitely much more artist uh centric yes and then um in december will be ocean city comic con so we got multiple states here um and that'll be uh it's a one day it's december 11th uh from 10 to 5 and that is in ocean city maryland so Te technically ocean city and baltimore are in the same state oh yeah that's true yeah yeah, forgot. That, Geography, yeah. not our strong point. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> it's been a long week. <laughs> uh, I think that's all we had, right? Yep, that's before, it for now. Before we do go, I do want to once again beg, I mean, uh, encourage you to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you can get, uh, what are they, audio. You can get audio versions of the podcast listed as Insights in Entertainment. Video versions of all of our podcasts are listed as Insights into Things, available on Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Spotify, Castro, Stitcher, Google. Stitcher's on there twice. I got to take that off of there. Mm. Uh, <laughs> what else? Podbean, Buzzsprout, et cetera, et cetera. Anywhere you can get a podcast. Right. And we would also encourage you to reach out to us and give us your feedback. Which list are you going to look at here to read? We'll see. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us at Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We're on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. You can get audio versions of this podcast on the web at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can find video versions at podcast.insightsintothings.com. You can also get high res versions of our shows on YouTube at youtube.com. Dot com slash insights into things. You can find us on Twitch at Twitch TV, uh, Twitch TV backslash insights into things, where we stream five days a week. When I think of it, yeah, <laughs> if, we stream if, whenever. If I'm in the office, it, yeah, it's you know, <laughs> whenever. Yeah, I'm trying to stay faithful to it, but five days a week, pretty much. 
Uh, or you can get links to all that and more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. And that is it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.